17th day of December 2018, allegedly, according to that thing we call a calendar. And this, indeed, is the Ocelli Effect, broadcast live from the facilities of Ocelli.com, but also heard on a variety of other networks. We do appreciate you for tuning in on this particular moon day, Monday, as it might be. And uh, it is going to be an interesting week, although some plans are not quite set in stone. However, we are continuing the series tonight with Jordan Maxwell. Now, if you go to jordanmaxwellshow.com, there's a lot of stuff over there, uh, including Jordan's contact and ability that you can, uh, you know, a, a donate button so you could drop a little something into the bucket there and help out with Jordan's uh, care and feeding, as it were. Now, why do I say care and feeding? Well, that's because uh, that's how I was describing myself earlier today. Uh, and, you know, that, that's truthfully what it goes toward. But also, there is the Research Society. There is the, the ability you can join there for a one-time fee. That's on jordanmaxwellshow.com, as well as a few videos on demand and a great deal of other material, including the stuff that is public. But uh, it all starts when you go to jordanmaxwellshow.com. Now, another thing about that website, just really quickly, Jordan does appreciate emails, contributions, feedback about the shows, things like that. And uh, there is a contact form as well. And um, like I said, explore his work. And if you haven't heard of Jordan Maxwell, I'm not sure how you found my show, but welcome. Anyway, <laughs> Jordan, uh, it is uh, it is an interesting week for sure. And got to tell you, I had a lot of questions because we, we ended up not doing the last two uh, weeks, two Mondays in a row. And a few people uh, wanted to ask mainly, has the series ended? And I said to them uh, in reply, I said, no, it will not end until Jordan says it's over. Sometimes life gets in the way, though, of the schedule, if you will. And yeah. uh, we, we, we have our reasons, uh, yours and mine both, uh, for not necessarily uh, uh, making it on a Monday. But we're doing our best, and we are continuing on with the series. Um, so first of all, let me ask you how you're doing tonight. Well, I'm, I'm, I think I'm doing a little bit better than I normally am <clears throat> because normally when I come on your show, I've been very sick and, uh, and, I, and I'm kind of weak. You know, I'm 78 years old, but I'm feeling a little better tonight. And uh, so there's so many things we could talk about, so many things we still need to talk about. And, uh, and so I hopefully will find out, uh, when I did a show one time with Steve Allen, the comedian, musician Steve Allen, and he was asked, how are you doing tonight? He said, well, we're going to find out. <laughs> we're going to find out soon. That's my feeling. I don't know how I'm doing, but we'll find out soon. You know, before we get into the topic at hand, Steve Allen is uh, one of the most interesting figures in media history. Uh, oh, God, yes. And, and I wasn't aware that you'd ever done a show with him before. Oh, no, I've done television with him. I've done lectures with him. We spoke at universities together. We spoke in public together. Uh, we did a television uh, show together. Steve mm. Allen and I were very close friends. I loved him. He was a wonderful, wonderful, dear friend. And, uh, and you know, and, and I learned so much from him. And uh, I used to go over to his home, and he had an incredibly beautiful home in the Hollywood, in, in the mountains, in the Hollywood Hills. And uh, uh, what was his, his wife's name was Audrey Meadows, was it? I think it was Audrey Meadows was his wife. Mm. Uh, I, 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 I knew it was one of the, it wasn't the, the wife of Jackie Gleason on the honeymooners, that was... Steve Allen's sister-in-law, yeah. but uh, but you know, Steve and I were very close friends, and he was always very kind and very courteous, and very bright, incredibly intelligent guy. And so, mm. yes, yeah, you know, I had he, friends that, that uh, you know, mutual friends, uh, believe it or not, because of the JFK assassination research stuff. Um, uh -huh. And he, uh, he he actually was pretty well read on the subject. Um, kind of interesting the way he handled certain interviews and things like that, but uh, a lot of people might be surprised. Now, here's the funny thing. Uh, younger people have no idea probably who Steve Allen is. You need to go back in media archives and take a look at who actually innovated the uh, the nighttime talk show structure and things like that. wasn't Johnny Carson that came up with that to begin with, I promise you. Um, no. And here's the another thing first, about The very Steve. first show on NBC yep. 
call tonight show on the night show tonight show was Steve Allen and Steve Allen was a major major comedian musician movie star and he he came up with the idea for the tonight show on NBC right. and so everybody used to come on the tonight show from uh what was it uh Johnny Carson and and, and uh you know some of those guys uh, what was his name? The guy on the, with the motorcycles. Uh, what was his name? The last one, the big one. Are you talking about James Dean? Yeah. Ja, what's it, what was his name? James Dean or Evil Knievel or? No, no, I'm talking about the host of the Tonight Show. Oh, you mean, you mean Jay Leno. I'm sorry. Jay Leno. Yeah. Jay Leno. Yeah. Jay Leno. But unfortunately, no one, none of the, of the host of the Tonight Show ever thought to thank Steve Allen for coming up with the idea and producing the first Tonight Show. Nobody ever mentioned him. And, and, and he was such an incredibly important man in Hollywood. Mm. And everybody knew it. Everybody knew that he was the man. He was the top comedian. He was a funny, incredibly uh, interesting guy who wrote nothing but music. He wrote all kinds of musical pieces for movies and television. And, well, you know, see, that's, just, that's something I wanted to interrupt you with because yeah. uh, the fact is that, again, mutual friends, uh, I've known many a musician. I was a musician for some years, and I've known a lot of musicians over the course of my lifetime. And uh, some of them that knew or worked with Steve Allen, because he not only did television, but he also did uh, live performances in a lot of places as a stand-up comedian and a musician. Um, mm -hmm. Now, uh, you know, we're not talking about a guy who can play one or two instruments. Uh, leg the legend has it that if it had strings, Steve Allen knew how to play it for sure. Uh, yep. <laughs> and, and many other instruments uh, that don't involve strings, Steve Allen, also knew how to play. Now, not only that, but he was well-read in an academic sense. He was well-read in a, uh, a, a sort of subversive literature sense. He was one of those guys who read everything, it seemed like, uh, and really quickly and, and absorbed and retained things extremely oh, well. He was um, extraordinarily good at that, yeah, reading and, all kinds of interesting stuff. And talking about any subject, you bring up any subject with Steve, and he was very knowledgeable. Yeah, that's the that's the fascinating thing. That's why I said he was a Renaissance man, because uh, in, intellectually, probably, I, I don't know if anybody ever actually measured his intellect, but uh, it was immense, given uh, the, the amount of, uh, of just aptitude it would require to learn yep. all those instruments, and he didn't just barely play a stringed instrument. He played everything from a violin to a guitar uh, yeah. quite quite expertly. Uh, but in addition to that, he was well-read, uh, again, academic papers, no problem, uh, books, you know, tons and tons and tons of books that he had read. Pretty much uh, people would have conversations with him and ask him if he had read a book, and generally he had, and if he hadn't, but the next time he saw him, he would have read it. Uh, yeah. It was interesting, and that was even if it was a day later, because he read very quickly. He was one of these guys who could actually truly speed read also, but retaining the knowledge. Fascinating yep. guy. I didn't know you knew him, though. Oh, no, I knew him well, and, and he and I did radio. He and I did lectures together in universities and, and, live, and you know, large audiences where I was on the stage with Steve Hell, and I introduced him, and he spoke, and then he introduced me, and I spoke. Wow. And he was so very, very much a gentleman, very, very nice, Boy, very if there, thoughtful. If he there's knew any film that of that, I was, I'll tell you, if there's any film of that, I think that would be priceless. Yeah, um, it was. It was. It was a priceless situation. I was on the stage with, with Steve Allen and the university, and and to show you what kind of a gentleman he was, he realized that I was under pressure. Because he knew that I respected him so highly and that I was, I didn't feel that I was worthy to even be on the stage with a man of that caliber. And so he said to the audience when he uh, introduced me, he said, Jordan and I have different opinions about some things. There are some things we, you know, many things we do agree upon, but there are some things that I maybe have a different opinion on than Jordan. But that doesn't mean I'm right. 
just because I have a different opinion. I may be wrong. Mm. Maybe he's right. Maybe I need to hear what he has to say. And I thought that was so very kind of him to say things like that to the audience in relation to me speaking with him, you know, because he knew that I was really nervous because being before a large audience and then having somebody like Steve Allen lecture the audience on some subject in theology or religion or whatever, and then I was to give my viewpoint with him. Mm. And he knew that I was very nervous, and so I thought that was very kind of him to say things like that. He said, just because Jordan may have a different opinion, it doesn't mean I am right. It just means it's a different opinion. Maybe I need to know what he knows. Right. And his skill as an interviewer, this is the last thing I'll say about Steve. I don't want to make the show about Steve Allen for sure, but uh, but the thing is that I, I need to mention this. If you want to see a big difference, because you mentioned, you know, Johnny Carson and these other guys who came after him and really benefited from his uh, uh, setting setting the standard when it comes to nighttime television and uh, doing an interview program uh, yeah. the way he did it. The fact is, you want to see a serious contrast, you can find tapes. Just listen to the audio, because uh, not all of the videos survived or not all of the video has been released uh, related to Jim Garrison being interviewed by Steve Allen. That's um, right. And uh, also the Johnny Carson video of Guess Who? Uh <laughs> You know, him interviewing the same guy. Take a listen to those two interviews, and you can see that Johnny Carson, yeah, he can read a script, and uh, certainly he was a performer uh, of sorts, but uh, he did not have the dexterity or the intellect to keep up with somebody like Jim. Um, That's right. And Steve Allen did. Now, Steve also gave a much fairer uh, uh, presentation (laughs) to Jim. Uh, and for Jim and allowed Jim to speak. Uh, and, and Jim Garrison, of course, is a controversial figure in the JFK assassination. Uh, you know, he, he has now passed away, but he was the uh, district attorney of New Orleans and uh, had later become a judge in life. And uh, actually, the JFK movie is based ho- almost entirely around the character of Jim Garrison. But um, mm-hmm. anyway, it, it's it's fascinating. You want to see a contrast? Take a listen to those two interviews and you will hear uh, the exquisitely different skill levels between Johnny Carson and, <laughs> and Steve Well, Allen. and also, yeah. I would add to that, that uh, the Johnny Carsons and the Jay Lanos and all those guys were great. They were very talented, obviously. But they got most of their show was was with their guest. The guest would come out and really make the show you know, flourish because they had interesting and great guests. Right. But with Steve Allen, he didn't need any great guests. The whole idea for The Tonight Show was to see, to, to, to see Steve himself. He was magnificent. He was fascinating and funny and clever and resourceful and, uh, and, and came up with so many funny uh, pieces and the funny stuff he would do. So he didn't depend on his guests to make the show. He was the show. Everybody, everybody watched the Tonight Show just to watch Steve. I mean, uh, you know, that, that's, that was uh, what I remember, is that he was always the center of uh, attention mm. on the Tonight Show. He didn't have to have guests. Uh, he was enough of an entertainment figure to himself. Absolutely. Yeah, well, now so. now that we've we've discussed this for a little bit, I do appreciate you giving me this insight and letting me know about uh, that you knew him because that that's just you have known a, a great many fascinating individuals over the course of your lifetime. I'll tell you. Um, and, and oh you, yeah, I've, you've <laughs> learned a great I deal. Tell you about. Yeah, that's the thing. Uh, you you haven't really sat and talked to me about him. Even when we've talked off air, you don't go, well, I knew this guy and this guy. You don't drop names. It just so happens <laughs> that a name yeah, well, comes up true. and all of a sudden, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, I knew him. Uh, it, it's it's really fascinating. Um, but, you know, let's let's get into the meat of the discussion. It's fascinating to me that you uh, – did, did you say you actually had a, a, a presentation with Steve Allen, though, related to religion? And, uh, oh yeah, oh yeah. Because I I don't recall what his views were like there. Um, I, I I I vaguely recall him discussing it once, but you know, at the time he was on television, and at the time he was on radio, this was one of those 
taboo sort of topics, even to do anything other than maybe be uh, somebody who read Bible verses rather dryly on the radio on Sundays. I mean, that that would be the extent of the media's yeah. presentation uh, during the time that Steve Allen was out there. Now, of course, today we have entire networks devoted to televangelists and things like that. Um, but, you know, at that time it was wholly different, so it's hard to recall what Steve's views might have been on it. Now, your views have certainly evolved over the years uh, as you've gone and examined these things and discovered and started asking the questions that you started asking. Um and we've gone over that. Jordan has told us what it was like when he was a kid and asking questions on this show. So here's the thing, guys. If you're in the live chat room at Ocelli.com or if you're on Twitter, um, matter of fact, I'll even open up my email. So here we go. I have three screens open right now. You have three ways you can interact very easily. Uh, you can uh, drop a question in the live chat room. You can email it to me, info at Ocelli.com, and I will uh, read it immediately on the air as soon as I get a chance to uh, to enter it into the conversation. Or if you're on Twitter, I've also put a post on there, and people can tweet their questions at me in case you're on a cell phone somewhere, and that's the easiest way to do it. And you're listening because I do know you guys are listening on the cell phone apps. Uh, you can do it that way. So I wanted to let everybody know that that's how they can do this when we are live. When we're not live, it is uh, it is just as easy to email one of us at one of our websites. And as this series continues, I will save the questions you send in and uh, present them to Jordan, and we will get uh, we will get the answers. And who knows? Maybe I'll even throw in some of my commentary. But mainly, uh, I, I want to uh, pass them along to Jordan, and I hope you direct your questions at Jordan. So. All that having been said, now we've dispensed with everything. Jordan, where is it we should go? We have gone through the Old Testament, the New Testament. It occurs to me that maybe we should talk about Christmas <laughs> because yes. this is the time of year it is. And uh, let me think about this. Well, you and I could get together on Christmas Eve. Uh, right. Because that would be seven days from now. You and I could get together on Christmas Eve and have this conversation. I don't know if you're going to be available, but uh, uh, I probably won't be because I'm, I'm, I'm going to be traveling on the road. Uh, but I would love to do that. I'd love to do a show with you on Christmas Eve. Well, but since since I most likely won't be able to, maybe we could cover that subject tonight. See, that's what I was thinking, is that just in case you weren't going to be, because I wasn't sure if you'd be traveling, uh, I, I figure, why don't we discuss the topic of Christmas now? Because a lot of people uh, are aware of the fact that this is a conglomerate, a sort of a, a composite holiday. And, um, you know, we're aware that Santa Claus really doesn't look like something that's in the Bible. Okay, I got gotcha. you. Um but it goes a lot deeper than that. The oh, time of just. year. Uh, we, yeah. we, we've we sort of discussed that before where we talked about the sun, S-U-N <laughs> versus the S-O-N and the birthday and all that. We started there, but there's a lot more to this. And, and, and I wonder if we couldn't just sort of tackle the overall topic of Christmas tonight. Yes. Uh, let me think about where we would start. If you, if you realize and understand that Jesus is referred to as the Son of God, He is our divine Savior. The Son of God is the basis for Christianity. Well, how are you spelling Son? S-U-N or S-O-N? Well, actually, in fact, originally it was S-U-N of God, the Son of God. And therefore, it is my opinion, based on the 60 years I've been looking at theology, since 1959, that's 59 years, I've been looking at this subject of theology and, and fascinated with it. But Jesus is a metaphor in the, in the New Testament. When you read about Jesus, think of, of, of the word Jesus not as a man, not as a literal historical man, but as a symbolic representation of the sun. The sun represents uh, uh, the, the coming of light into the world. 
And if you go back into the ancient world, you will see that there was something called sun worship. It was not actually the worship of the sun. The Native Americans were sun worshippers. The Catholic Church were, uh, has promotes sun worship. Christians were worshippers of the sun, S-U-N. And, but no one's ever thought about it. But that's exactly the case. As they go back to the ancient world, there was many different cults in the world. Some were called stellar cults. The one, the people who studied the stars and could see the future in the stars. It later became known as astrology. But astrology actually started as a religion thousands and thousands of years ago in the relation to something called the stellar cults. Mm -hmm. And then there was a moon cult where there were people who worshipped the presence of the moon in the sky and saw the moon as some kind of a divine entity in the sky. And that was called the lunar cults. And then there were many people in the ancient world that saw in the sun the attributes of God. There was no one ever actually worshipped the sun as a god, even though we call it sun worship. No, no one actually worshipped the sun. But they did show the ancient sun worship was actually to draw the attention draw people's attention to the fact that the sun was the most logical representation of God. God is like the sun. Not a sun god, though, but it, the, the sun represents the qualities of God in that it is very bright. It brings light into the world. And so if you're very intelligent, you're very bright. Well, obviously, God, God is going to be more than just bright. He's going to, he's going to be the brightest thing in the heavens. Well, the brightest thing in the heavens, as far as we humans are concerned, is the sun. And so today, the sun is still recognized as the greatest example describing God, because God gave us warmth. He, kept, he keeps us warm and that, you know, we can live and he, and he causes our food to grow so that we can have food to eat. He allows all the creatures of the earth to reproduce and they can grow because of the sun gives energy to the world. And so the ancient Egyptians said that you know, the sun was pure energy. And therefore, being pure energy, if the sun kept its energy and didn't give it to everybody like it does, then the sun would last forever. But, but the sun doesn't do that. The sun is very generous. It gives his energy to a whole uh, solar system. The whole of the solar system uh, that we live in is kept alive by the sun. All the planets get to see the sun. They get to feel the rays of the warmth of the rays. And so we are at the right place in the right time on the earth. And so it's not too hot. But then it also is warm enough that plants grow and we can have food and we can have warm places to live. And so the sun was seen as our savior. Mm. And the sun comes up every morning, so it was our risen savior. And our risen savior was because, the reason why he was our risen savior is because the sun is your savior. If it doesn't come up in the morning, we're dead in three weeks. The whole earth would freeze over and we're all gone. We will all be dead. All animals, plant life, everything. Without the sun, we have no life on the earth, period. It's gone. Mm. And so, therefore, the mere fact that the sun comes up each morning, because he promised he would come back, so the sun does come back every morning. About 5.30, he brings warmth and light and light to the world and so obviously this those are qualities of god god is very bright he brings warmth into the world he brings food and life and like i said the the, the sun is pure energy and the egyptians understood that and they said if the sun were to keep its light that we would be dead of course we'd be gone but the sun would live forever because the sun is energy and energy is light and so since the sun is very generous and gives up 
his energy to the universe every day. He gives up his, his life so that we might live. Therefore, it is said that God's son died so that we might have life. He right. died for us. Right. And that's true because the sun is dying each day. It keeps giving up its, its energy. One day it's going to burn out. And well, so the George, sun let, me, is, let me ask you something here because an interesting thought sort of wanders into my mind while you're describing this, and I'm listening very carefully. And uh, that is, I, I remember reading stories about uh, Native Americans. And now, bear with me a moment. Native Americans, and they saw, you know, the the white man or the Spanish man arrive on the shores here uh, of this place that we we call America today. Um, mm-hmm. And they did not recognize that they had come from these boats. They really thought they just sort of arrived out of nowhere. They literally didn't see the ships. Uh, according true. to the accounts that I understand. And the reason mm-hmm. is because they had no point of reference for it. It made no sense. They literally couldn't see something um, because it was out of their out of their psychological understanding. Now, I'm wondering something about this sun worship idea. Um, and and, and I, me- I mentioned this for a very, very good reason. In the nighttime, ancient people who maybe were able to build a fire or whatever, but you certainly couldn't light a city or light the roads or any of that, and if the moon wasn't out, couldn't the entirety of the world seem to disappear without the sun? And the only way that it comes back is when the light comes back. Because in the mind of someone who has very little understanding of exactly, you know, the sun is up, the sun is down, what's happening, the nighttime could be an extremely frightening time because the rest of the world seems to go away. That's right. That's exactly what I have said. The whole world realized that our life on earth was a, was a battle between light and darkness. And therefore, light represented intellectual, spiritual intelligence, spiritual intelligence. We say that people who are very, very well informed and highly intelligent, we say that they are brilliant, brilliant scientists and brilliant philosophers. Brilliance is a word that's used in relation to degree of light. And so these people who are very filled with light, they, like the Bible says, they're filled with light. They are brilliant people. And so the sun is is the most brilliant of all of us. It is the most brightest thing in, in, in the life of mankind. And so we're talking about the sun representing symbolically all the, all the symbolic qualities of the almighty God. We don't see the God. And this is why, and even in Christianity, uh, the Bible says we cannot look and see God. Mm. We, but Jesus said, if you see the Son, you've seen the Father. So if you've seen the Son, S-U-N, then you've seen all the qualities that you would see in God if you could see him. God is brilliant. He's, he's filled with light. There's no darkness in him. Darkness implies evil because that darkness at night the devil comes out, and the devil is referred to as the prince of darkness. Mm-hmm. Darkness was evil. And this is where you get the uh, the, the basis for, uh, for racism today. The dark people, people of dark color were, were evil, and the people of light were good because light is good and darkness is evil. And the prince of darkness is the, is the devil. And you take the word evil and put a D in front of it, becomes devil. And so you take an O out of good, becomes God. God is good and the devil is evil. It's the light and darkness. It's a war going on today on the earth between light and darkness. For the, when the sun comes up in the morning, uh, the sun is called, the sun god of Egypt was called Horus, H-O-R-U-S. Horus was the sun god of Egypt, and he represented all the qualities of Almighty God. He brought warmth into the world. He gave energy for living things to, to live. And so the sun was referred to as a, as, a, as a god, and his name was Horus, H-O-R-U-S. And, there we, and, and, and it was said in the Egyptian religion that Horus walked across the sky. 
And then, you know, basically that's what the sun does. It kind of just walks across the sky from the east to the west. And when it hits the west, it dies and it's gone. And now it's left the world in the, in the hands of the prince of darkness. Darkness was very frightening to the ancient man. Why? Because, it, you know, we have homes and heaters and television and <clears throat> all the convenience. When the ancient peoples of the ancient world didn't have those. They didn't have indoor oh, heat and plumbing. They didn't have the, 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 you know, the nice things that we have today to protect us. When it's freezing out, we go in, we have heaters, we have warm beds. And so we are very fortunate to have, uh, you know, got to this point where we can protect ourselves from the weather. But the ancient people didn't have that protection. So it was very frightening when the, when the sun would leave, it's going to get very cold. And so while the sun is out, you better work hard. You better find a place to live and build a house, build some kind of a protection because when the sun goes down, the animals are coming out at night and they're the predator animals and they're looking to eat something and, and they know you are out there. So it was a very dangerous time to go out at night. Still is. In big cities, it's very dangerous going out at night time. So, well, why? Because the prince of darkness. Everyone was afraid of the dark. <clears throat> but if you go back to the idea that on the first day of summer, here's where it all is put together. I'm going to try and put it all together for you quickly. On the very first day of summer, we have to remember that almost, almost all of the ideas that are in Western civilization's religions in Christianity, in Judaism, etc., Western Christianity religions are based on the Northern Hemisphere. We don't have a whole lot in Christianity dealing with the with the Mayas and the uh, Toltecs and the Aztecs and the uh, South, the Central and South American religions. Christianity is basically made up of the Northern Hemisphere ideas. And so in the northern hemisphere, in the summer, the first day of summer, the sun is as high in the northern hemisphere as it's going to go. The first day of summer, the sun does not go any higher in a northern hemisphere. It's has reached its highest point. It's the first day of summer. Now, 90 degrees later, if you get a round circle and put, you draw a round circle and Put 360 dots around the circle, uh, you know, perfectly aligned with the circle, 360 dots. Those 360 dots are the 360 degrees of a circle. And the circle is, three, circle is a round circle with 360 dots. And therefore, if you take one dot, pick a dot, it doesn't matter which one on the circle, and draw a straight line across the circle to meet its opposing uh, dot at the bottom. Now you have cut the circle in exactly half. And so now the, the top of the circle is the first day of summer, and the bottom dot is the first day of winter. Now you go back to the top again and go only 30 days, or go only... Uh, 90 days, 90 degrees, 90 days. 90 days is three times 30, and each month is 30, 30 days. So we figure, okay, so if it's 30 days per month and you go for three months, that's a season. So therefore, if you go from the top dot 90, 90 degrees and draw a line from that 90 degree mark all the way across to the opposing mark, which would be 180 degree, 180 mark on the other side, you've now divided the circle into four equal parts. The sun in the summer, the sun in winter, the sun at the autumn equinox, and the spring equinox. And so now you, you've got four pieces of the pie, which is on your wristwatch when you're looking at your watches, 12 numbers in a circle. And the three is opposite of the nine, and the twelve is opposite of the six. And so that's where we get the idea that on the first day of summer, it's very hot in the northern hemisphere. 
And so the sun is considered to be very hot. So we say things like that. I mean, this singer is really hot. This this person is really hot on that subject. And as a dancer, so-and-so is really hot. So when you say somebody is really hot, means they're very prominent. And so the sun is very prominent in the northern hemisphere on the first day of summer. And then 90 degrees later, 90 days later, 90 days later, it's the end of the third month. Each month is 30 days. So now you reach the fall and uh, autumn equinox. And so we say that it's fallen because he was really hot on the first day of summer. Right. And, and he's very, very hot in the northern hemisphere. But in 30 days later, three months later, it's coming into what we call autumn. And now he's not so hot. I mean, he used to be really hot, but now he's not that hot. And now, why? Because he's fallen. He, he just doesn't have the old stuff that he had in the first day of summer. He's just not that hot anymore. Yeah. So therefore, he is. Uh, he's at the what we call the fall of the year. Why? Because he's fallen. He used to be really hot, but he's not that hot anymore. So now he's fallen. And therefore, now he's really falling. After the fall, he's really falling. Now he's falling all the way down to South America. The sun is going south. And that's why the birds go south. The animals go south. Why? Because the birds are not stupid. They're going, they're, they're not leaving, they're not going to live here. They're going down south to where the sun is. So the birds, you'll see all the geese and the birds flying south for the winter. Why? Because if you had the time and the money, you fly down to the Rio and lay on the beaches in the sun down there because it's going to be summer down there now and it's going to be winter up here. <laughs> right. And so today we say that when this winter happens, the sun is dead. Why? Because when the sun goes southward on the December 22nd, it begins what is called the solar, uh, it begins the, uh, the winter, the solar winter. Right. The sun is as low in the southern hemisphere as it's going to go on the first day of winter. So now it's cold. And according to us here up in the, in the northern hemisphere, the sun is no good to us. It's freezing cold here. So the sun has left us. It's no good to us now. He's dead. Mm. He's gone. And so on December 22nd, 23rd, and 24th, those three days, the sun rises down in the southern hemisphere. It rises on the same exact degree for three days. Well, anything that's been moving one day, one degree southward every day since the beginning of summer has been moving one degree each day. It finally hits December 22nd, and that's the beginning of winter for us. The sun is gone. It's frozen here. And so we find out that the sun rises on the same degree down south in Rio and in, in uh, South America. It rises on the same degree for three days. And so for three days, the sun does not move northward or southward. It just rises on the same degree for three days. So the ancient people said that the sun that was rising in, uh, you know, in the summer and, and going down to the fall and then going down and really falling falling dead in winter, he was dead for three days. For three days, the sun did not move northward or southward. It just came up on the same degree. So for three days, God's son, the light of the world, that's what he was referred to, Jesus referred to as God's son, the light of the world, and he was our risen Savior. And of course, the sun does rise, and it is your Savior. And so for three days, the sun rose on the same degree, which means it didn't move north or south. And therefore, the ancient people said that the sun was moving southward each day, one degree each day it was moving southward. And now it stopped for three days, so that God's son was dead for three days in the tomb. And then on December 25th, the U.S. Navy instruments will show you, world instruments will show you, that the sun moves one degree northward. Right. One degree northward. 
Well, any degree at all is better than not moving at all. And so for three days, he's been dead. Now it moves one degree northward. And so now he has been born again. The sun is now becoming back to life. It's moving again. It's been dead for three days, and now it's moving again. Now as it moves another 90 degrees or another 90 days at the end of a three-month period, it's now coming back to the northern hemisphere. Thank God. It's coming back to us. It's going to bring warmth, and it's going to bring the, the sunlight, and the, everything's going to be beautiful, and the plants are going to be beautiful, and fly out, and the animals that come out reproduce, and it's just going to be a beautiful world in the northern hemisphere. Thank God, because he's come back. He's coming back. And so we say that we call it spring. Why, why do we call it spring? It's because it's springing back to life. We say it's springing back to life. Why? Because he was dead for three days. He moved northward on the December 25th, one degree, which means he's back in life. He's back in the, he's back in the game. And now he's coming back to us. Mm. So he's springing back to life in spring. Right. Now, and, a couple of things here. That almost sounds like, though, this, this idea of death and then rebirth, that sounds like that belongs around Easter time, uh, and yet it's happening around Christmas time. <laughs> that's, that's right. That's one thought. Um, no, that's true. That's here's, true. Here's another thought, though, uh, because uh, I, I have a question uh, from a listener, and they ask uh, if if the name – that is given to the sun, you know, and the names that are given to the sun uh, have anything to do with the Roman god Sol, uh, which uh, the Greek of the Greek course. god was called Helios, and I think he's an equivalent to Sol, but uh, Sol is spelled S O L. S O L. That's right. And the the other question they have here is if that's if that is the case, then why is it the same name for a person's soul? That's exactly how they wrote it. Yeah, well, I, I understand. Uh, sol, S-O-L, is a Latin word for the sun. And, and, uh, Om, O-M, is a Hindu word for the creative power of the sun. The great creator is the sun. Or uh, Om. This is what you have in Hindu, the priest of Om. The Om is a symbol for the power of the sun to create. Both words are used in relation to the sun, Sol, Om. And in Egypt, the city of the sun, today we refer to it as Heliopolis, city of the sun. Helios is the sun and Opolis is the city. Mm -hmm. Heliopolis is the city of the sun. And so we have Sol, S-O-L, Om, O-M, Om. And in Egypt, Heliopolis, we call it the city of the sun. But the Egyptians didn't call it City of the Sun, Heliopolis. Heliopolis is a Greek word <clears throat> for the City of the Sun in Greek. But the Egyptians will tell you, if you go there and look at what, what the Egyptians are saying about their country, the Egyptians will tell you that Heliopolis is today actually referred to originally and still is called today on, O-N. On is the name of the sun in Egypt. Look it up in the dictionary. O-N is on. Mm. On is Heliopolis, or the city of the sun. And so, therefore, if you take Saul, yeah, Latin for the sun, Om, Hindu for the sun, and On is the city of the sun in Egypt. It's Saul, Om, On. So this is where we have Solomon, King Solomon. There was no King Solomon. It never existed. There is a king of the heavens. God in the heavens is the sun. And his term, his name is Solomon, King Solomon. He was the wisest of all kings. Well, because the sun is the wisest of all kings, because it's brighter than everybody put together. <laughs> so that's why he was so very bright and so very intelligent. He was called King Solomon. So therefore, don't look for these. You know, if you go look for the temple of King Solomon, 
there was no King Solomon, so therefore there couldn't be a, a, a temple for King Solomon in Jerusalem because there was no King Solomon, never existed. Is the con, putting the three words of the sun in the ancient languages together, Saul, Om, An. And so the actual historical that people, I have full of people on the earth who are very well studied in this subject know. The highest degree Freemasons know. The highest degree people in the world that are running the planet, they know what you don't know. And that is that King Solomon is Solomon's temple. Solomon, as I said, never existed. So there was no King Solomon. So there could not be and has never been a temple in, in the Middle East called uh, King Solomon's temple. Mm -hmm. But you will find out that there is a temple in the, in the, uh, in the Middle East in Egypt called Solomon's temple. In Egypt, not the Holy Land. There's nothing holy in the Holy Land mm -hmm. except the stories. They're full of holes. Right. But in, in Egypt, there is something called the Temple of Solomon. And the Temple of Solomon is the Great Pyramid of Giza. Not the Middle Pyramid, the biggest one, but the one before it is the Great Pyramid of Giza. And the Great Pyramid of Giza is known to the intelligent people of the world, the you know, officials who run the world, the presidents and kings and rulers, people who really know what's going on on the planet. They know that King Solomon's temple is the Great Pyramid of, of Egypt. It's the Temple of the Sun. It's the Pyramid of the Sun. Mm -hmm. We know that that's what they call it, the Pyramid of the Sun. Well, the Sun is Sol Om An. Therefore, the, the Great Pyramid would be King Solomon's temple. It's considered to be a temple in Egypt. Right. So now, this is why... There, you know, there, there is another question that comes in that, that dovetails perfectly with what it is you are talking about right now. Uh, because they are asking... Uh, they, they heard you state earlier that uh, there was no singular man that is uh, called Jesus. Um and so they wanted to know if it's possible, because many times in history, there have been people that have been named. Uh, let me let me let me read through this real quick. The, OK, that have been named, uh, but are really more than one person. OK, I get what you're saying now. Yes. Uh, in other words, about Jesus, I, what they're asking, they're, it's kind of an incoherent question. I'm sorry, uh, anonymous emailer, but I know what you're asking. Is it possible, Jordan, that there is uh, a Jesus a composite, composite, a composite where yes. there's many different people who did these things, and therefore they've been named Jesus? That's an interesting thought, because even when it comes to this character of King Solomon, and Solomon, yep. as you showed us the composite word, is it also not possible that this is uh, a bunch of kings or a bunch of highly knowledgeable men who brought together knowledge that are being symbolized through this singular character? I think that's what they're asking about Jesus, but I put the question to you about Solomon as well. Uh, do you think that this is a possibility uh, that it also happens to go very well with the you know, with, with, with the yeah, astrological with the, with the reality, subject. but but yeah. please, yeah, go. You you know where we're going with this, right? <laughs> of course, of course, of course. Uh, yeah, uh, that uh, the very man Jesus in the Bible, in the Greek, in the Greek uh, scriptures, in the ancient Greek, the sun was spelled I E S O U S, but we know today that you can interchange I's and J's, J's and I's. A, a, a J is an I with a little tail, so it's interchangeable. J's and I's, according to the dictionary, are interchangeable. So if the Greek spelled the sun, and the ancient Greek spelled the sun as Iousus, I-E-S-O-U-S, -E you take it and change it from I-E-S, I-O-E-S, Iousus to J-E-S-U-S. So it becomes Iosis, becomes Jeosis, or Jesus. Jesus is a word for the sun. 
And so that's why God, we refer to him as God's son, the light of the world. Of course, the son is the light of the world. And now you can ask yourself to clarify this in your mind. Ask yourself, who owns the sun? I know lots of people on the earth think that they're smart enough to own the sun, but they don't own the sun. Well, who owns the sun? Well, logic alone would tell you, if there is a God, if there's a creator, that he owns the sun, not us. We humans don't own the sun. God owns the sun. And so, therefore, we go out in the morning, we see this bright object come up. It's around like an eye. And therefore, if we, are, if we are the students of God's Son, we are his pupil. And so we are following the light in the sky. The circle is God's, that's God's uh, eye. He's watching us from the, from the, uh, from the heavens. But the point being is that he, who owns the sun? Nobody owns the sun. God owns the sun. Therefore, it's God's sun. And God's Son is the light of the world. Well, of course, the Son is the light of the world. And so that's where we get the idea that Jesus is Jesus. It comes from Iusis, which is a word for the Son in the Greek. And Iusis, if you change the I's to J, it becomes Jesus. And so Jesus is nothing more than a symbolic representation of the Son. And the sun represents spiritual and intellectual light. It represents life. Without the sun, there would be no life. So Jesus represents the light of God. He is the light of the world. And because people need to listen to the light, they're in the dark right now. People are in the dark all over the world. They need to enlighten themselves go to a school and learn how to read and start thinking and enlighten yourself and now you will be filled with light and well, so yeah. this is all true now what's fascinating here is because they're asking about the idea of a composite character um yeah. I, I think it's worth noting here because we're, we're going to come up against the, uh, the the first hour and we'll take a break when when you're through with this particular train of thought. But I want to add this in because you've described on other shows uh, exactly how some of the stories, some of the biblical stories are literal descriptions of the astrological movements. Now, not everything is necessarily just attributable to this unless you search really deeply uh, I wonder about Solomon and the descriptions of Solomon if uh, these things are also very much attributable to uh, the, the movement of things in the sky, uh, uh, to, to put it really in a poor, poor sounding way. Uh, you know, if, if the story is really symbolic, like you told us the, uh, the, the story about Jesus telling people when he was on a boat that, you know, uh, the, when, when I, when I rise, uh, this will all stop because there was a storm and uh, he wasn't afraid for his life or anything like that. And indeed, when he did decide to rise, uh, the storm broke. Well, that's what happens when the sun comes up, that's uh, right. you know, and, and I'm wondering if there's a lot of ways to sort of unlock the stories about Solomon uh, in exactly the same way. And is everything that is in the, uh, the, the Christian narrative effectively in the New Testament, is everything attributable to, um, to, to, to astral, uh, to astro theology, basically? Uh, can, can you always find a correlation between the movements in the skies, or is this something that is sometimes there and sometimes not? No, no. It's the whole of the New Testament, as I said, I am totally convinced, after looking at this for so many years, the whole story of the New Testament, the New Testament story of Jesus, is nothing but an allegory. It's an allegorical story. It's a symbolic story, a metaphor. It's telling you a story about human life on the earth from day one. That's why it's written, the Bible is called the greatest story ever told. It is the greatest story ever told. Why? Because it's the only story that's ever been told. That's why it's the greatest story ever told. The greatest story ever told is man's continual continual life fighting with darkness. The light fighting the darkness. 
There's a mankind's life is filled with either light or dark. Half of your half of the world is in the light, other half is in the dark. Meaning light is a word that's used in relation to intelligence. So if you're enlightened, that means you're filled with light, we say this person is brilliant. And so brilliant is a word that's used in relation to light. So if you're really enlightened, you're brilliant. And so the whole idea of the New Testament is showing you the war between light and darkness. Mm. The devil is referred to as the prince of darkness. And uh, Jesus is God's savior. He's our the God's son, which is our savior. The son is your savior. As I said, if it don't rise, we're dead in three weeks. If the sun goes out, it's going to get an awful chilly around here real quick. And we're going to see what Ice Age is really like. And so that's why God's Son is our risen Savior. He's the one that saves the human race. And if it wasn't for him giving his life, his energy, that we should live. God's Son gives his life so that we might live. That's right. His life is the energy of God's Son, S-U-N. So he's giving his energies, his life, so that we might live. It's an incredible story, of just explaining how Christianity, we still go to church on Sunday, S-U-N, Sunday. And all churches around the world, all Christian churches, intermingle the two words, S-U-N and S-O-N. You will see, like, uh, on... on uh, on church church uh, billboards, you will see that uh, the the coming of the sun. They refer to it as S O N Sunday, S O N day, or S U N day. They interchangeable. The churches interchangeably use the word S O N and S U N. And go on the web and type in Christian Church Sun S O N Sunday. Sunday for a Christian church, and you will see thousands of churches around the world, Christian churches called Sunday, you know, such as that Sunday church, or go to church on Sunday, Mm S-O-N-D-A-Y, or S-U-N-D-A-Y, interchangeable. I don't interchange them. The church does. And so, you, you know, once you understand the whole of the New Testament story is the story of the Son. That's why you go to hear the story on God's Sunday. And this is why I said in the beginning, if you divide the circle into four equal parts, those are called seasons. Seasons are the four parts of the, of the, of the year in which the sun plays a particular part. It's either high, hot on the summer, or cold in the winter, or cooling off in the fall, or coming back to light in the spring. And so it was called, uh, you know, God's Son has four parts to his life. That's why you have the whole of the New Testament is based on the four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Spring, summer, autumn, winter. The four seasons are the four Gospels. And uh, so, I mean, there's so much more I could tell you, so much more that, that, that we need to talk about in relation to this. Well, absolutely. I... But, you know, what we're going to do is is I want to note something really quickly uh, that, first of all, you, you know, when people say that someone is dumb, it's kind of interesting because dumb sort of sounds like dim, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, and, exactly. And, we say that dim. And you, you, you could be a dim wit. That's and right. this literally means that your wit is not very bright, and therefore, see, it it goes all the way around, not just uh, not right. just for the positive terms, but into the negative. And uh, exactly I certainly right. want to discuss this some more, but I'd also like to get into how this correlates to the uh, the, the Saturnarian holiday. Uh, a lot of things seem to happen around this twenty fifth of December. And, uh, you know, it, it's kind of strange. Meanwhile, uh, if you take a look astrologically, it seems more likely that, uh, 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 the Christ figure in the book was probably born on September 11th. Um, or that's very close to it. it. <laughs> right? That's right. You that's know, exactly right. According to 
the ancient writings, Jesus would have born was born on 9/11, and 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 there's a lot of interesting documentation on that in relation to Jewish. Uh, it's, it's according to Jewish philosophy and Jewish theology that Jesus or the Messiah will be born on 9/11. But then, when, but then when you combine, I see the reason why I said that this is a composite holiday. You combine yeah. the Saturnarian holiday, which had this giving of gifts and also uh, drunken parties of debauchery, uh, which was a Roman thing. You combine mm-hmm. that along with uh, the idea that at one point there was this practice of sacrificing uh, uh, children, from what I understand, to a red-hot god. That you would place the child in the lap of the god, you heated the god up, yep. and uh, mm-hmm. gee, you know that red hot god that you have to sit screaming children in the lap of sounds kind of like Santa Claus, uh, you know. That's except right. the kids don't get burned to death; they just freak out, and maybe it's something deep in their own uh, genetic memory that's telling them, "Hey, this is not a good scene." Uh, but yeah. but there's a lot to this, Jordan, and I want to get into it even more now here at Ocelli.com. Of course, we do appreciate you no matter how you're catching this further on down the stream via your fondle slab of choice, your applicable application, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, your podcatcher du jour. Uh, we are happy to be back in the Apple iTunes store after a six-month fight. And, uh, you know, it's it's kind of funny because one of the reasons why I was actually kicked off of one of the other networks uh, recently... <laughs> That that was carrying the show uh, is is live with me tonight, Jordan Maxwell, <laughs> and Jordan didn't know that by the way. I just just spit that out right now because uh, honestly, I I am encouraged by uh, by this, <laughs> and uh, we'll we'll have Jordan on as many times as he wants to come on the show. <laughs> Regardless of who kicks me off, because you know what? The home base is Ocelli.com. This is where you go, and I don't care how many places ban me, change up what it is I do, disagree with what it is I have to say, disagree with my guests, get angry, call me a Satanist. I don't care. I know who I am. I know who you guys are that really listen to and support the show, and I know who Jordan Maxwell is, and I'm glad to have him along. Also, we're going to get deeper into the discussion on Christmas, give you a few things to consider, including, hey, the Saturnarian holiday. I mentioned that. Doesn't that sound familiar? Wait a minute. That might have something to do with the uh, one of the cults of Saturn that uh, became prominent in the Roman Empire, but this goes even deeper. Jordan, first of all, uh, uh, thanks for making uh, making my my week last week because you you were on the list of the many things that apparently I had done wrong to get myself kicked out uh, or kicked off of a network. But <laughs> I I thought it was funny. I'm not dismayed. You got kicked I'm not off bothered. a network. Yeah, you got kicked off a network. I sure did. <laughs> and and the reason why is because of me. Partially, yes. <laughs> Well, I, I, I'm telling you, that's what, that's, that's the, you know, that's no good deed goes unpunished. Never Anytime does. you want to talk to the world around you about the truth, I told you, I've told you over and over in this program, most people do not want to hear the truth. That's They're right. not interested to hear truth. They want to hear what they want to hear. They want to wear what they want to wear. They want to eat what they choose to eat. They don't want to eat something they don't want to eat. They don't want to wear clothes they don't like. They want to wear and eat and live the way they want to, not because of what, you know, they don't care what the real truth is. And so most people don't care about the truth. They want to hear what they want to hear. They want to hear that the Lord loves them and that the, 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 and that when grandmother passed away, she went to heaven. And, uh, and you, when you pass away, you go to heaven. And so my point is that, you no, know, this is why today if we go to church, you are referred to as a believer. Mm-hmm. If you go to a new church, they'll ask you, are you a believer? And if you say yes, then that means you're a Christian. Yeah, you're a believer. But I don't want to be a believer. I want to be a knower. I want to actually be able to read and study and use my brain and know. And check everything out that you think you believe, because that's the way the U.S. government operates. Governments operate all around the world. 
on not on on what they believe about you. They want to know what they know about you. They don't want to believe it. They want to know where you go when you eat, and where do you go when you buy, and where do you believe, and what what team are you on, and what what uh, what political party do you belong to, and you know they they're checking everything. Because they don't want to believe you're okay. They want to damn well know. They want to know positively. So they want to know. They don't want to believe. Well, the same thing with me. I don't care to believe anything. I want to know where the beliefs come from Mm -hmm. and who is who taught them to us and where did they get these ideas. And now you can understand where we come with all these ideas. Uh, and when at the founding of America, Christmas was not really uh, allowed in, in, in America, in the colonies. Well, one one second, so, before you go there, I want people to remember this. Uh, when you take a look at the word belief or believe or believer, remember the one thing that is in, 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 in absolutely a part of that word. And if you just separate the B-E away and you separate the uh, the end, you find the word lie. I just want you to know that if you take a look at it very carefully, the word lie is contained in the word belief and believe. Okay. No, you're right. <laughs> so, you know, yep. it, it's just, it's, it's right there in front of you. And, well, you know, people that's, believe, that's people believe, Jordan, that Christmas is one of these sacred ancient things that has been around forever. But it's interesting because you were just saying that in America initially, the uh, the founding fathers, you know, those people that we venerate all the time and try to quote and misquote and misunderstand and argue about their intentions. It's kind of funny because they did not want Christmas to be here almost universally, although it was available to them to make it into a holiday, they call it. And uh, I, I, I find that really interesting. You know, the, the founding fathers that they tell us were of the utmost Christian, up, you know, upstanding Christians and all that, which we could do a whole show on that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But right. how about we talk about the founding of America and how Christmas was not part of the package deal to begin with? No, no. Christmas was not part of America in the very beginning, the very first days of the, of the colonies of America. Christmas was not celebrated. Why? Because the, founding fathers realized where it came from and what it was all about and so uh, you know, so you need to understand that the reason why after the colonies became states and we become and we begin to become very successful and very beginning to grow into a country then all of a sudden one day somebody came up with the idea and it's very interesting who did it somebody came up with the idea of let's re establish a holiday uh, and, and, and we'll make a lot of money we're talking about a business we'll make a lot of money by reestablishing something called Christmas and so they started reinventing this holiday called Christmas and now we find out do you know where Christmas began who started Christmas back up uh, even though it wasn't allowed in the very beginnings of this country, but today it's become a very big celebration. It was Coca-Cola. The Coca-Cola company gave us today what we call Christmas. They came up with the idea of Christmas and they sold it to the American people. It's called Coca-Cola Company. Because all of a sudden, one day, Coca-Cola started promoting the holidays. And they called it Christmas, and they showed how the Coca-Cola, everybody will be drinking Coca-Cola on the holiday. So it was a corporate idea to reestablish the old uh, Saturnalia and call it Christmas, Christ Mass. The Mass, you go to church, you go to Mass, dedicated to Christ, so it was called a Christ Mass or Christmas. And Christmas is based on Saturnalia, and the Coca-Cola company knew that because the Saturnalia was always a big party. A big party in Rome was called Saturnalia. Everybody got there and had drunk. Had, everybody got drunk and eating and drinking and having a, a great time celebrating the Saturnalia, celebrating the coming of winter. And the birth of the sun going back to the spring. It was a big celebration. 
And so Coca-Cola promoted the idea and, and called it Christmas. And so today we still have a big celebration that's, that's really gone into the business world. It's really become commercial. We call it Christmas. But we have Coca-Cola Company to thank for bringing us back into the, the celebration of Christmas. It was an old Saturnalia, a Roman Empire celebration of the 12 days of, uh, of winter. The 12 days, you know, Christmas was always 12 days. That's where your song comes from, first of all. <laughs> you know, on the, right. well, on the first day of Christmas. Okay, they, everybody always asks, right. why is there 12 days of Christmas? This is why. Uh, secondly, there's a lot of things about Saturnalia that, uh, that, that people don't necessarily know. The Romans at one point didn't even want it, <laughs> even though it was their holiday. Yeah. Uh, why is that, Jordan? It's because the part of the Saturnalian holiday, Saturn is what was, is, you know, you can mix up the letters in Saturn, it becomes Satan, Saturn. And so, um, what was I going to tell you about, uh, about why we have holidays? Where does that uh-huh. come from that we have holidays all over the world? Peoples of all countries in the world have holidays. Usually there's five of them. Usually there are five major holidays in all countries of the world. And the reason why is because the way you uh, look at your watch, uh, as I said, if it's a round watch, you'll see 12, 12 numbers in a round circle. And, and each one of those circles represents, each one of those numbers represents a month. So the 12 months of the year in a circle. And so the 12 months of the year, as I told you at the beginning, is draw a round circle and put 360 dots. And the 360 dots are 360 degrees of the sun moving across the sky each day. Each day is a degree, and it moves one degree each day southward. And so there are 360 degrees representing 360 days, and that's the way we keep track of business and government keeps track of business on a 360 degree circle but in fact there are 365 days in the year Mm -hmm. so what are you going to do with those other five days in the year because the government keeps track of taxes and money and, and politics and everything else on 360 days in the circle not 365. Well, yeah, but you got 365 days. What are you going to do with, uh, with the other five days? Well, we'll just forget those. Just act like they don't exist. And so the best thing you'll do is just give people a holiday. Let them celebrate a holiday. Let them take a day off and give them five days off a year. And they're called holidays. And so we have five holidays. And you know, each country has different holidays. And in America, we have Christian holidays, which is the birth of God's son, Christmas. And then the uh, Easter is the uh, re-entering into the northern hemisphere, bringing the sun back. We call it Easter. And it's actually the celebration of the sun coming back to the northern hemisphere. We call it spring. And so we have five holidays. Holidays are trying to explain away the five days we don't use every year because we only use 360 days, a 360-degree circle. And so that's where we get the idea of holidays. And, of course, then if you have the help of big corporations like Coca-Cola, they'll give you a new holiday. It's called Christmas. And everybody drink, buys, buys tons and tons of Coca-Cola on holidays like Christmas. Never realizing, no, Christmas is a old Saturnalian holiday in the ancient Rome where people got drunk and raped each other and fight and kings were, were uh, you know, landowners, the big wealthy landowners would trade places with their slaves. The slaves became the landowners and the landowners became the slaves. And the slaves could do to the to the landowners anything they wanted to do because they were in the position of landowner, and and that that's the way the holiday worked. So whatever the landowners, when they were the wealthy landowners, they were slaves to their slaves. 
they had to take the position of a slave, and the slave could do to the landowner whatever he wanted, because that's the law. That was the religion of the Roman Empire called the Saturnalia. Mm. People don't know that. that. That's that's basically what we have today, a bunch of drunken parties and, and people who think that they are you know, people who think that they're important uh, are not important and the people who are nothing more than just the slaves act like they are in charge of everything and so we call it Christmas or Saturnalia based on the planet Saturn Saturn is today uh, most important God in all the religions of the world Judaism Satan, uh, Judaism Christianity uh, even though Christianity's main God is, of course, the Son, God's Son, the light of the world. He is our risen Savior. But uh, Saturn plays a very big part in, in Christianity. But it's very big today in, 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 uh, in Judaism. Judaism is based on the worship of Saturn. Today, mm-hmm. Judaism is referred to as a Saturnalian religion. Judaism is worship of the planet Saturn. And Saturn was called El. In the ancient Phoenician Canaanite system, the word for Saturn was El. And, and there's another ancient system in, in, in the ancient Middle East. Saturn was called uh, El, was one word, one term. And today, of course, we know that El in the Bible is God to the Hebrews. Well, look up the word L, and you will see L was the planet Saturn. And so today the Jews are worshiping the planet Saturn. And there are other terms that the Phoenician Canaanites used for the planet Saturn was a word they called Saturn Shabbat. S-H-A-B-B-A-T-H, Shabbat. Look it up in the dictionary. You will see Shabbat is a Phoenician Phoenician language word for the planet Saturn. Saturn was called Shabbat. And therefore, if you're going to worship Saturn, it was called the Sabbath. Mm. The Sabbath was worshiping Shabbat. So today when you hear the preachers telling you that remember to keep holy the Sabbath day. Remember to keep holy the Sabbath. Sabbath is the worship of the planet Saturn. Go back and do some homework and you will see that you are worshiping an ancient pagan god called Saturn from the Roman Empire. And therefore today the Jews count their holy days from sundown to sundown. And so they go to Temp El. El is Saturn. And so they go to Temp El to the house of El or to the house of Saturn on Saturn's day. This is why all Jews go to the temple on Saturn's day, Saturn day. Mm-hmm. So Judaism is nothing more than the worship of an ancient planet called Saturn. He was referred to as Lord of the Rings. Of course, the Saturn was the Lord of the Rings. The ancient Hebrews were told, the old Jewish religion told the men, if they're getting married, you get married before your god, Saturn. So you wear a wedding ring. Women were to listen to their God. So they were supposed to wear an ear ring because the ring represented the planet Saturn, the Lord of the Rings. And the Jews are still making movies in Hollywood today called Lord of the Rings. And most people going to the movies, watching movies like Lord of the Rings, think it's all a wonderful and brilliant, beautiful, wonderful story for the kids. No, it's the story of the Jewish God, Yahweh, Saturn, El. They go to Temp El, go to the house of El on Saturn's day. So, it's called the Sabbath. The Sabbath is Shabbat, the worship of the planet Saturn. And even in the Bible, it talks about how Israel worshipped the planet Saturn And the star that was associated with the planet Saturn is called the Star of David. If you go back and look at the Star of David, it will tell you it's a hexagram. The Star of David is a hexagram. You draw a line. What the ancient Babylonians would do is draw a circle on the ground and draw a triangle inside the circle. 
and then turn it around and draw another triangle the uh, the opposite way and becomes a six-pointed star within a circle. That's today called the star of Saturn. Look it up in the dictionary. A six-pointed star inside of a circle is a, is a hexagram. It's called the hex. And this is why the Jews wear the hex around their neck. They wear the Star of David. They think it's the Star of David. No, it's not the Star of David. It's the Star of Saturn. Saturn is Shabbat. You worship him on Saturday at the Sabbath. The whole of Judaism today is the worship of, of Saturn, the planet Saturn, the god Saturn, and also going back If you take it even further back, it's the worship of the sun. Everywhere in every synagogue on the earth, no matter what country you go to, every synagogue on the earth has an altar. If you go to a synagogue anywhere in the world, you will see on the altar the the name of God, and it's always, always pictured within a sun. There's always a bright sun circle or the sun with the sun spokes. And then the name for God inside the sun is four letters, four Hebrew letters. And then the Jews will tell you that the name of their God is so holy and so sacred that we cannot use that word. You're taking it, if you use it at all, you're taking it in vain. You should never take the name of the Lord God in vain. Well, if you even take it because you're a human, if you even call God by his name you're taking his name in vain so they have come up with another word the word which means they are God but there's a word that they can use that you can use too and if, and so you're not going to offend God if you use it because it's just another word for the God of the Hebrews right. and, it's, and, and it's always pictured inside of a sunburst on the t- altars of any uh, of any temple And the four letters inside the sun is referred to as tetragrammaton. Mm -hmm. And all Jews will know what a tetragrammaton is. It's the four letters that make up the name uh, that was dreamt up for the God of the Hebrews. They don't use his name because it's too holy. But if you want to talk about God, you can use tetragrammaton. It's four Hebrew letters inside a circle of the sun. And so the word is tetragrammaton. Tetra is four. The letter four is tetra. Gramma is a letter like A, B, C, D, E, and F. Those are gramma. So tetragramma is four letters. Well, that's what it is. There's four Hebrew letters inside the sun. Inside the sun. So it's a tetragramma aton. That's tetragrammaton is broken down to tetra. Grandma Aton. The Aton was the great sun god of, of Egypt. The Aton was the sun. So therefore, on all altars around the world in Judaism, you will see a star, you will see the sun with the sun burst with all the spokes around it. That's the, uh, crown of thorns. We are told about Jesus died with a crown of thorns. The crown of thorns is the sun rays. The sun spokes around the sun. And this is why Jesus would die with a crown of thorns, like the Statue of Liberty. It's a crown of thorns. It's representing the sun. And so the word for God today in Hebrew is tetragrammaton. Tetra, four, gramma, letters, aton, sun god. The sun god's name is tetragrammaton. Mm. So just understand that if you're Jew and you're Jewish, you're worshiping the planet, you know, they're worshiping the sun, Tetragramma Aton, and, and then more recently, you are now also inculcating into that worship, the worship of the planet Saturn, right. Saturnian. L is Saturn in the ancient language, and L is where you go to the Temp L to worship the planet Saturn, the Lord of the Rings. That's why the Jews are still in Hollywood making movies about their god, called Lord of the Rings. Mm. You know what's interesting is that when I was a kid, I, I know I was I was told that uh, the reason why it's called a holiday is because it's a holy day. Um, 
But there's uh, a few more aspects to this. <laughs> yeah, you know? like the, and, like and, the and, holly, like the Hollywood. Well, yeah, there's that. But but and another thing about this holiday thing is uh, we 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 don't. Where, where did the tree come from? Yeah. Because you know, look, I, I talked about Santa Claus, and that does relate to a uh, to a Sumerian god that yeah, uh, they used right. to sacrifice children to. They used to literally stoke this thing, heat it up by dumping wood and coal and things into it, and you would sac- put a sacrifice on it, which would be singed to death. Uh, that that that's a reality. Um, yeah, that was done in Cana, and and mm-hmm. that was done in what we call the land of Cana, or right. what we call Israel today. Right. The, so there's that aspect right there's the astrological there's all these things you know what why is the sun when why is the sun being born on that day well it's got to do with the sun rising we get all that where did the tree come from jordan and also what is the deal with holy day why is it holy well hollywood like you said there's a hint but uh so so both of these questions i think are in play first of all the the uh the reason for why it's called a holiday and also uh, the tree, why, what, you know, is, is it simply because it's a woden tree? It's a wooden tree? I'm not sure. Uh, what do you think of that? Yeah. Well, the reason why you have a tree, because the tree was a, what is called an evergreen tree. The evergreen means it's green always. It's evergreen. It's always green. Even in the middle of winter, it's always green. Right. And so it's called the evergreen. Well, that was a symbol. And the symbol was that with Jesus, life is always, always protected. There will always be life on the earth because God's son is the light of the world. And he is the one who's giving his life so that you might live. So therefore, the tree became the symbol of everlasting life. Why? Because all the trees died. During the winter, all trees died. The, 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 you know, the, the branches are shedding all their leaves and it just looked dead. Except the evergreen tree. It's all still got all of its green leaves. It's got everything. It has, it's not being affected by the winter. So it became a symbol. That's why mistletoe is a symbol. Because it's a symbol that it stays green. It's just as alive today as it was in the summer and in the spring and in the fall. And today in the middle of winter, the devil green tree is still green. So it's the promise of life, the life forever. Oh. Life will always go on forever. And so when you die, you will go to heaven with the Lord. And uh, and you will always be alive. And the evergreen tree is always alive, even in winter. So it became a symbol for everlasting life. The symbol, you know, the word, the term that was used in relation to what Jesus did for everyone. Because Jesus is the Son, and the Son does give everlasting life. Because the Son is there, and every year it comes up, and it becomes, you know, it comes back to the spring. And therefore, everlasting life. That's what God's Son, the light of the world, does. It gives you everlasting life. Right. As long as there's a sun coming up, thank God there will always be life. Well, because that's it's, true even when it's high in the sky, when it's low in the sky. It doesn't matter. It's always giving life. At You know, it, the, the, the trees and things, certain things do go away. But that's another interesting aspect of this is that the sun is a constant. It's not like it go. I mean, there's couple of spots on the earth where it goes away for a little while (laughs) but generally speaking that wasn't known to uh to the people who devised this idea to begin with so uh the idea was that the sun is always coming up it's always there otherwise we wouldn't be alive anyway but uh the evergreen tree kind of goes along with that as well that there's always the sun uh, it, right. may, it may be not quite as warm because it's not quite in the right place in the sky to make it good and warm for you, but it's always there. There's always it's light. It's always there. That's and, right. It's always light. But what about the holiday, the, the, this idea of a holiday? Like I said, when I was a kid, they told me it was because it means holy day. And I said, well, you know, why is Thanksgiving holy? And at this point, I was usually told to shut up. Uh, but, <laughs> you know, because That's it couldn't right. give me a religious reason for Thanksgiving. Uh, you well, know, Thanksgiving was about, you know, this and that and the third thing and lie, 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 a lot of crap, really. Thanksgiving is a made up thing. 
Let's be honest, okay? <laughs> but well, it was it was a made up thing. But uh, but the idea is is that you're giving thanks to God that you're still alive and you're still here. So you're thanking God for the <clears throat> to have food, <clears throat> to have the sun, and have life. So you're thinking about your family, and you thank God you have a family. You thank God you're alive to experience your family. See, I'm a pagan, and, and have, I do that every day. You know? Yeah, I know. Well, I, just, I know, I know, but that's <laughs> that's where it comes from. But but and, what's interesting to me is a holy day, a holy day, and uh, what, what what is what is the real reason for that? Well, what was the name of that singer, that incredibly brilliant, talented uh, singer? What was his name? He he made the song Holly Holy. Remember that song Holly Holy. Um, hmm. Well, they're, they're you're not thinking of Burl Ives, are you? No, no. no. Uh, it was a young man, young Jewish boy, a very very talented, hmm. brilliant voice. I loved his song. Everything he did was just great. Um, Holly Holy was the name of the song. Well, I'll figure, and, I'll figure it out. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm remiss because I, I usually know his name. I can't remember it right now because my mind is tired. But anyway, uh, the idea that religions have been the same for thousands of years, we're still today believing the same things we believed 10,000 years ago. And, the, and King Solomon's temple is actually the Great Pyramid of Giza. That's King Solomon's Temple. Uh, Neil because Diamond is who you were thinking of, by the Neil way. Neil Diamond, that's it. Neil Diamond. He read that song, Holly, Holy. And we now know that the Holly tree is uh, considered to be holy among the Druids. And today we have uh, the Druid establishment in America is in Hollywood. Because the you know the holly of the tree is a Hollywood, and that's why we got Hollywood because of the Druids, mm. and the Druids what what we call the original Hebrews, the old Hebrews were called the Druids called themselves Hebrews, and so the Hebrew religion is actually a Druid religion, and it's all very interesting. It's all very interesting stuff. If you just take the time and go back and with an open mind, your mind has to be open because your mind is like a parachute. Don't work if it's not open. So you need to open your mind and, and learn how to read and learn how to think and go back and take some logistic courses in college and university on how to think logically and how to compare thoughts and ideas and belief systems and where they came from and then you begin to see that the more we change the more we stay the same we're still believing the same old stuff for mm -hmm. thousands of years but that's changing now and Christianity is going to change it's in the process right now of dying and going into a new world order mm -hmm. Christianity is going to change and believe me, you're not going to see it in your lifetime. But if you're a child and you're in Christianity today, by the time you reach 90 years old, you will see a tremendous change in the Christian religion. Because no longer, you know, the, if you go back into history, the idea of a man hanging on a cross, we call Jesus, there was no man on a cross for 600 years. For the first 600 years of Christianity and any and all churches of Christianity from the 1st century to the 6th century, for 600 years, there was no man on a cross in Christianity, period. That was developed, the idea of putting a man on a cross and representing Christianity happened in the late 6th century. At the beginning of the 7th century is when the idea of putting a man on the cross. So that is interesting. I think that Christianity, when it was founded, had no man on a cross anywhere. That came 600 years later. <clears throat> well, what's interesting about that. that is that <clears throat> if one does carefully read uh, what happens here when it comes to the crucifixion, mm -hmm. uh, Pilate 
you know, what does he do? He turns them back over to the Pharisees. He, he turns them back over, says, you know, you want me to let Barabbas go or you want me to let him go? Uh, yeah, uh-huh. get, let, let Barabbas go. We, we, we <clears throat> want him to be punished. <clears throat> yes. He says, look, I, I turn him back over to you. To, because I don't find any fault in him. Yeah, to use your laws on him. Now, if, if, if we take a look at an understanding of what the laws would have been, um, seems to me as though he should have been stoned to death, if mm. anything, if he had committed a, a high crime, according to what I read, which is not crucifixion. And indeed, the Romans didn't use crucifixion <coughs> in this way during the time period. I mean, but then again, you know, I, I have an odd reading of history, I understand. But you know what, guys? You can go a lot deeper into this subject and a whole lot others. Uh, religion is just one of the areas. We're, we're talking about Christmas. We're talking about Christianity tonight. But we've covered Islam and Judaism and really the Western world of religions uh, on this series. However... If you want to dig deeper, there is the Research Society, which you can easily get to over at jordanmaxwellshow.com. Now, you have to be a member to go into the Research Society, and you can join for a one-time fee over there to be able to go in and go much deeper into all these topics. Jordan is adding, or I should say Jordan's webmaster, is adding tons of material all the time, and there is going to be uh, a lot of updates there because there's a lot of uh, material just waiting to be put onto the website. First of all, second of all, over at jordanmaxwellshow.com, there's also these videos which you can get on demand. You still have two of them up there, right? That's right. There's still, still have the two. <laughs> yep, there's still the two up there, and these are obviously videos directly from Jordan Maxwell himself, and uh, you can get them for a lot cheaper than you would if you were going to purchase a DVD and have it mailed to you or something, or Blu-ray, whatever they're on now. I don't know. I wouldn't bother with any of that because you can directly have them uh, by just paying a, a couple of bucks, and you have it yourself right there at your fingertips. So yeah, we're streaming. We're streaming the videos so people can go on the, on my website, jordanmaxwellshow dot com, right. and you will see in the top right hand corner uh, the two videos I have, and just click on them, and you can watch them right then and there. They're being streamed, and for a couple of dollars, you can watch them, watch both of them. Absolutely. And from what I, from what I remember, the two of the most important subject matters I deal with is <clears throat> the symbolism uh, of the Illuminati and where this idea of the masters of this world come from, and who are these people, and what are their symbols, and what are they talking about. This is something I started talking about back in 1966. I started talking in lectures many, many years ago. I began talking about the Illuminati. And that I got from Myron Fagan's uh, records, the Illuminati. And if you go on my website and join my website, you will see there's an audio video uh, area where you could go and listen to some of the old audios and videos. Mm-hmm. And one of those top first audios on my website is called Illuminati. And anyone who's never heard this, sub, this, this particular, uh, lecture, it's about two and a half hours long. It's the most startling thing you will ever hear in your life. I heard it back in 1966. And started talking about it in 1967, early 67. I started integrating the idea of Illuminati into my lectures. And I heard it in 1966. And so that 1966 recording of the Illuminati I have on my website. Mm-hmm. And you can go on my website, the Jordan Maxwell Show, and then join my research society. And then one of the first, first departments you will you will see is audio video. Go there, press audio video, and listen to the very first audio track, which is two and a half hours long, and it's called Illuminati. And if this, if, if that doesn't blow your mind, nothing's going to. Because I was so impressed with that lecture. I was, my head was spinning when I had heard that back in 66. <clears throat> I could not believe the information in that lecture. It was so startling. Today, 
it is still just as incredible and startling as it was in 1967, mm -hmm. some 40 some odd years ago. It was the most extraordinary thing I've ever heard in my life. And if you want a real eye-opening awakening to the world you live in, go on my research society and click on the audio video. And the first one is called Illuminati by Myron Fagan. It's an extraordinary expose on the world you live in and how it really works. You will never, you'll never see the world the same again. Once you've heard that lecture and you'll listen to it two or three times, you will continue to pick up stuff you didn't hear the first two and a half hours. The more you hear it, the more you will learn and the more it will sink into you and you will begin to see the world the way it really actually exists. And it's going to blow your mind. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, it's the most extraordinary story you've ever heard. And I, that's why I put it on my website. And it's amazing that, that you have an audio there from uh, over 50, 50 years ago. It's 52 years now yep. uh, since 1966. <laughs> and just uh, it could be more depending on what part of 1966 it was in. So over 52 years possibly uh, old that recording is. But there's a lot of stuff over at jordanmaxwellshow.com. Of course, you can make a donation you can send jordan an email he does like to hear from you and he certainly appreciates uh anything that goes to the care and feeding of the teacher who is jordan maxwell now here's the uh here's the key to it though you have to actually go to jordan maxwell show.com because you got to put it all together one word jordan maxwell show.com uh because that is the only website that is actually jordan maxwell's uh, and it is the only website that is run by and handled by Jordan and his webmaster. That's it. Anything yep. else out there is not Jordan Maxwell's website, jordanmaxwellshow.com. Another thing really quickly before we uh, try to wrap up this sort of Christmas episode <laughs> of the uh, of the series is uh, you, you also told me that uh, some stuff is now out on Gaia TV and um, – I haven't gotten a chance yeah. to take a look at it. Do you do you know exactly? Because I know they did a bit of taping and some work with you. Uh, yeah. Do you know what what subjects they're covering? Well, uh, yeah. First of all, if you go to Gaia G A I A dot com, Gaia G I G A I A is Gaia dot com. You will see that it's got like eight thousand videos to and video presentations. It's an incredibly brilliant website. It's a massive website of all kinds of lectures and teachers and all kinds of subjects. <clears throat> and just type in Jordan Maxwell and it will take you to George Norrie, coast to coast radio uh, talk, talk show personality, George Norrie. <clears throat> well, George Norrie does a series. Each month he does a series of lectures where he entered interviews people from all over the world <clears throat> and he interviewed me for like an hour <clears throat> so if you go on uh, G-A-I-A Gaia dot com and go to Jordan Maxwell you have to join Gaia it will cost you a few pennies it will cost you a little something but you join Gaia and then you get Thousands and thousands of documentaries of occultism and religion, philosophies, all kinds of interesting stuff to listen to. <clears throat> and uh, and then type in my name with George Norrie and Jordan Maxwell, and then it will take you to the uh, the interview he did with me. And then there's other things that I've done. There are two other videos I've done for Gaia Company. <clears throat> just myself. So it's been an interesting life I have lived, and it has cost me dearly. And I think to myself many times, if I had known what my life was going to be like, I would never, ever have started doing what I was doing back in 1959, some 60 years ago. I began studying the world of occultism a world of hidden religious belief systems and governmental systems and how the world really works. Banking systems, governmental, 
uh, military, uh, law, how the world law works. All of these strange and important subjects today, most people have no idea in the world about. But I have always loved researching and studying all the things that are secret. I love the idea of secrets. I know the world is run by secrets. Secret societies, secret laws, secret banking, everything is secret for the higher-ups, the guys who run the planet. They have secrets. They're not telling us how the world really works. And I've always been interested in secrets. I want to know how the world really works, right. not how you tell me it works. I want to know how it actually works. A couple of notes about the Gaia TV thing. If you're looking for it on there, it is. I'm going to give you a link to it uh, along with the podcast and all that. And uh, I'll try and drop it in the chat room while I'm on air here. But we're almost done, so maybe I'll just link it to the podcast. Uh, Beyond Belief is the name of George Norrie's show over there. But That's there's right. also a couple of brand new videos up on the Gaia TV thing uh, called The Secret Life of Symbols with Jordan Maxwell. Uh, so the, the, these are the, the videos that are over there at Gaia TV. But again, do you have a link to this at uh, jordanmaxwellshow.com yet? Uh, say that again. Do I have a link to what? Yeah, do you have a link to the guy to Gaia TV? Uh, at no, your I website? don't. No, I don't. Okay, no. well, I will make sure to put in the links for Jordan's website, <laughs> the yeah, uh, okay. the research society, and also for Gaia TV. I'll, but but you know, primarily start with jordanmaxwellshow.com. dot com. But if you're interested in Gaia TV, it is some amazing stuff. They call themselves uh, Conscious Media. And, uh, they, they do have, uh, at least these three pieces with Jordan that are, e you know, easily accessible. I guess there's some membership, but whatever it is, you gotta sort it out with them. I'm just letting you know what's there. Um, yep. <laughs> and, uh, but, but I I'll obviously suggest go to jordanmaxwellshow.com first and, uh, check out Jordan's work. Like I said, you can email him, make a donation, go into the research society, check out the videos, all of that. So with the last couple of minutes here, Jordan, because I made sure to get in all the stuff about the website and, and this about Gaia TV before we got done, um, I wanted to uh, to ask you what, what you think your final thoughts should be because we're not going to hear from you again until, well, gee, wait a minute. We might hear from you on next year. Next year. <laughs> so <laughs> so this is the last uh, 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 part of the series that we'll be doing for this year. On religion, and we tried to cover Christmas. I know that I'm kind of painful. I interrupt you and things like that. You know, some people criticize no, no, me for no, it, but, yeah, yeah, but no, no. I, I I think that you do very well, and I'm always happy to be able to talk with you. You and I, you and I get along fine, but sometimes the yep. listeners complain. They say, you know, you talk too much. I'm sorry. It's a talk show. I'm a talk <laughs> host, and you know what? Jordan can use a minute to take a drink or a breath too. Okay, so think about it. Anyhow, Jordan. <laughs> yes, sir. The last thing that we want to kind of like uh, uh, throw at people about Christmas, about uh, religion here for this calendar year. Uh, it's it's all up to you for the next couple of minutes. We've already gone through the website and all that stuff, and we talked about Christmas and the composite holiday that it is. Uh, and, and really there, there's even more to it, but, uh, but I want to kind of just give you the last word for this last part of the series for this year. Well, uh, I would say that all of our holidays, religious holidays are based on ancient, ancient texts, ancient stuff that's been around for thousands of years. And we don't know that, you know, the Jewish people do not know about their, uh, beginnings in the uh, the lunar cult. Moses was a leader of a moon cult, and therefore the people who followed Moses were not the ancient Israelites. It was a it was a cult that was following the moon worship, and most people don't know that. The Jews do not know that Moses was a moon was a moon god. He was leader of a moon cult in the ancient Arabic world. <clears throat> and, uh, and and so the Christians do not realize, I think a lot of them are beginning to realize that Jesus as a man was actually a symbolic representation of the sun. And the sun was a symbol of brilliance and intellectual and spiritual enlightenment. 
So when you read in the Bible something that Jesus did or that was done to Jesus or Jesus said or what Jesus thought and what Jesus said, always keep in mind is talking about the sun that represents intellectual, spiritual enlightenment. So therefore, whatever Jesus did, that's what somebody who was spiritually enlightened would do. Whatever Jesus said, well, that's what the sun, representing the light of the world, would, would say. Intellectual, spiritual enlightenment, uh, what happens to it? Well, we know what happens to intellectual, spiritual enlightenment. It gets nailed to a cross and dies and spit on and, cross, and beaten by the kings of the world. The people of the world will beat you if you're trying to tell them the truth. They will actually cause a call for your death. They will beat you and, and nail you to a cross. And so if you try and tell people the truth and try and help them to understand, they will turn against you. They will turn you into the authorities. They will turn against you and you are, a man's enemies will be those of his home, own household. Mm. And Jesus said, you have eyes that do not see, <clears throat> and you listen with your ears, but you do not hear, and with your heart, you do not get the sense of it. So just continue to bad mouth and to persecute people who are trying to educate you and trying to get you to wake up and do your own research and do your own thinking. And, and, and those people, just remember, they're going to be tortured, they're going to be Nailed to a cross, so to speak. They're going to have to carry their own cross because Jesus said, what they have done to me, they will do to you. No one listened to me and no one's listening to you. So do the best you can to try to help your fellow man like Jesus did and you'll end up nailed to a cross. You so know, it, it, reminds me, it reminds me most directly of, uh, of Dr. Martin Luther King as well. Because he even stated that, listen, I, I'm probably not going to live through this. <laughs> That's right. That's and, what he uh, said. And he was he right. Said like, he said, yeah, like everyone else, I would like to live. But I know my days are coming because the people don't want to hear what I have to say. And he knew he was going to be assassinated. He knew that. Oh, yes. And, and that's that's the interesting thing, is that uh, a great many people who do stand up and attempt to teach and attempt to make a change and to enlighten you and to bring more light to the world. That's uh, right. Quite often are attacked, defamed, destroyed by others as opposed to just being really respected and truthfully heard as the teachers that they are. And uh, there is a great deal of truth in that part of, you know, some people think that when I do a presentation like this, I mean to say that there is no truth contained in the scriptures. Uh, absolutely the opposite is true. There is absolutely a whole lot of truth in those scriptures. You just have to know how to read them. And That's exactly right. Jordan, I think that's another thing that we need to keep in mind is that reading the holiday is something that we should do also. Reading all of the holidays, if you will, is something that we should do and consider what it is we are doing. And again, jordanmaxwellshow.com is Jordan's website. This has been another one in the series uh, about religion with Jordan, and it will continue, by the way, until such time as Jordan decides he's done. <laughs> and it's just yeah, that simple. I, mm -hmm. I will let you know uh, there is at least a chance that I'll be, I'll be available. And if I am, I'll let you know a day or so ahead of time if I'm going to be available for next week because I'm not sure you know, where, where my life is going to take me right. from one week to the next. So I'm, if I'm available, I'll let you know. Well, and, listen, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get to it as we get to it. I, I'm willing to deal with your schedule however it goes. Don't worry about it. And, uh, but I'm just letting the listener know that this series is not done. Okay, so that's all there is because I got a bunch of emails. Actually, are are you done doing the series with Jordan? I haven't heard about it in a while, and I'm. It's like, listen, it was two weeks <laughs> that I know. it didn't happen. Been... It's okay. No, I'm still talking to Jordan. Jordan's okay as far as I know, and he's still coming on. So keep yep. that in mind before you email me again, <laughs> asking me is the series gone? If Jordan doesn't make it for the next two weeks again, that's a possibility. But as far as I know and as far as Jordan knows, we're not done. 
So this yeah, will we're continue. We're not done because there's so much more that I need to say, so much more I need to clarify. Exactly. And But the, but the bottom line I want people to understand is I have no problem believing in God. I have no problem with the idea of a great spiritual presence, uh, somebody, something that we would call God, some sort of a spiritual presence of life in the universe. I don't have any problem with that at all. As far as I'm concerned, I know there's a God. I know there's a spiritual dynamic to the human life that we live. So don't say that I am against God. I'm not against God. I'm against the organized religions which have misled the people into believing things that they don't understand. And what I want to do is try and help people to get an education and go back to understanding where theology and religions and the idea of God actually comes from and get rid of all the darkness and then you left with a great, a, a new understanding. You'll be able to stand under the, the foundation you're building on to understand. And that's what I want to do. I want to be a teacher. I want to help people to learn where ideas have come from. So that's what I do, and I have to have help by people like you, Chuck. People like you are giving me an opportunity to speak and to share with the world something that's taken me 60 years of my life studying to be able to give to the world off the top of my head. And it's an extraordinary experience being able to talk freely about the subjects that I'm very interested in. I want to thank you for doing that. Now, listen, you don't have to thank me. I thank you for... uh for presenting this information, for uh, giving myself and anybody who who dares or cares to listen, uh, you know, the, the, the ability to unpack these things and to actually take another look at something that they might have just accepted in the past. And this is always a learning process. Every day that you're alive, every moment, in fact, you have the opportunity to learn something else.